What is up, gods and legends? He is Jay King from The Athletic. I am Sam Jam Packard from the World Wide Web. We are still potable, and we are coming to you today, uh, another day removed from the Celtics' fun loss to the Atlanta Hawks. They gave up a 30-point lead. They had terrible offense down the stretch. Jay, I don't know if you've been on the internet uh, since the Celtics lost uh, until now, but people seem pretty upset and uh, very worried about this Boston Celtics team. I wouldn't say everyone, but there's a vocal few out there. You're a Celtics beat reporter. You watch that game. You're fairly familiar with this team. How worried should people be about these Boston Celtics? The 55 or are they 57 and 15 Boston Celtics? That game is proof that the Celtics have absolutely zero chance to win an NBA championship. Wow. There's just no shot. I mean, All right. That's the if, show, folks. If Jaden Springer can't defend without fouling a jump shooter in the final minutes of games, how are they possibly going to excel in the playoffs? I just don't know. What if, if they can't hold Springer off? doesn't get eight minutes in the fourth quarter in the playoffs? What if they make an adjustment? <laughs> no, no, the, the overreaction was hilarious. I had people in my mentions like, Joe Mazzulla needs to be fired. It's like, do you, do you guys watch the NBA? Do you people watch the NBA at large? I don't think so. And and granted, it was a terrible loss. Like, absolutely atrocious loss. Up 30, let their foot off the gas. Crunch time offense was despicable. Every red flag that has been waved around this team over the last few years, it was evident in in that game. However, <laughs> this shit happens. It happens. Celtics have... Now only won 19 of their last 22 games, I believe it is. And they've clinched the one seed with weeks to play in the regular season. It was a shitty, shitty, shitty loss. But it happened when the Hawks got red hot from three and the Celtics went ice cold from three. And shit happens sometimes. And you know, Derek White and Drew Holiday both weren't playing. And that's a huge deal. Like, they're a totally different team when those two guys aren't playing. And and sometimes people make mistakes. And you know what, Jay? I started this episode with a huge mistake. This is not a God pod. This is the one free episode. And some people might be watching this on uh, CLNS YouTube channel. And thus, we are brought to you by Prize Picks. Use promo code CLNS and you'll get a $100 deposit match. So this is the free episode. We are still potable. Uh, we are on Patreon Monday through Friday. Go to patreon.com slash still potable and you can get us Monday through Friday. I thought this was a God pod for our mid tier members, uh, but no, this is for we everyone. We just discussed that in the chat, like no, no longer than 15 minutes. That's ago. what I'm saying. It's pretty easy. You get into March of the NBA season. You can let your foot off the gas. That's what I didn't have the right focus. Uh, and I think I've uh, kind of suffered the same affliction the Celtics did. I didn't have the excuse. I mean, I guess B Rob was out. He's the equivalent of Drew Holiday and uh, Derek White. He's our yeah. He's our he's our backcourt. Oh, what what role do I play then? What are our roles on the pod? If Derek White is the backcourt, what would you say you are? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm like Tatum and Brown. I would say. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that as soon as I asked the question. <laughs> You couldn't you're, even you're get me one of you're them. You're Zingas. I feel like you might be a wink guy, and like, wink like if, if, if people were chanting your name at the garden, you, you'd you'd give the the nice little whatever he does, a little fist bump. 
So that's fair. I would wink. I would give a fist bump. I would play uh play it up to the crowd. Um You're just a happy guy. He seems like a very happy guy. He's always seems satisfied. You just seem like a happy guy. And you and you're just gonna say you're the um the both number one star and number two star of the podcast, the kind of foundation of everything, the engine that makes everything run. Um and the and the two guys who just can't close down. And I'm Joe Mazzula. I'm the coach as well. <laughs> An absolute maniac, I would say. Uh, that, uh, that yeah. Was, I do like. And I I'm Brad Stevens. Okay, well now you're. Just, I orchestrated this. Okay, I'm Al Horford. Then we can just all claim different things that were. Uh, <laughs> just eyes. Like, what are we? What are we doing? What, what makes you Al Horford? Um, gorgeous eyes. Um, wisdom. Been doing this a long time. Everyone looks out, uh, looks to me to kind of set the bar. Um, consistency, toughness. Uh, I love to tell people when to take a timeout. Um, you know, big flincher, big flincher on rebounds in certain situations. All right, <laughs> enough of this nonsense. Enough of the tomfoolery. Enough of the ballyhoo. I don't care about the Celtics giving up a thirty-point lead. That happens in the NBA, especially the modern NBA. Three-point shooting happens. They only made one three in the second half. The um, Krejci, uh, I'm assuming he's from the Czech Republic because that's the only context I know that name from, uh, goes wild from three. The the Hawks, they start Krejci playing was hot. Krejci was real hot. He was. And so it, the comeback part does not bother me. The part that bothers me is the late game execution because I feel like earlier in the season, they've had similar, just terrible offensive possessions. And the Celtics, when you ask them after the game, they're like, yeah, we suck there. We need to work on it. And I like their Kaizen approach. I like their growth mindset. You have to embrace your failure. But part of that is correcting it the next time uh, that situation occurs. And so the Jason Tatum possession where he just did a, a decent amount of dribbling and then gave up the turnover that led to the Bogdanovich three on the other end. What about the uh, eight-second violation? That was also not great. Really indicative of the slow pace they were playing. Um, and then with 50 seconds left, the Jalen Brown nonsense possession where it looked like him and like Tatum and Porzingis were doing a little bit of something off ball, but it didn't materialize anything. It was just Jalen Brown dribbling for 24 seconds. At some point, I'd like them to try something different. Um, I feel like they have a capacity to do so. I feel like they've had some moments where at least it's just Tatum going to the rim. But those possessions were the ones that were, I would say, frustrating. They didn't uh, cause deep panic in my eyes. But it's like, what are we doing here, fellas? What? Why? We've been doing this for, what, many years now. Why is that kind of the thing that we end up with? It's like, how many times do you have to hear... Just play faster. That's it. Just play faster. Play with some pace. Keep it up in the fourth quarter. Don't let off the gas. Make sure that you're operating at a high level just with pace. Because if if they play with pace, a lot of that stuff just goes away. Then you're not dribbling the ball 20 times in a row. Then you're not waiting till the end of the shot clock and putting up some bullshit. You're getting into stuff. You're getting into actions. And when the Celtics get into actions, they have enough talent that they can just create advantages and they can take advantage of advantages. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> take advantage of take advantages. advantages. I think it's just they take advantages. They capitalize the on advantages. There you go. And, and, but you have to play fast to, to get to all that stuff. And to me, what, what separates their team is that they have so many threats, that they have so many guys that you have to cover, that you have to worry about, that are threats out there. They're not, they're, they should not be a team that goes to ISO late in shot clock. They should not be a team that just runs the same set over and over unless they, you can't stop it. But they should be a team that like incorporates everybody, make puts stress on your defense because you can't guard everybody. And when they go slow, that takes all of that away. And you can load up and you can force them into bad shots. And and they just they allow themselves to be guarded sometimes 
because they fall back into that. And obviously, like they weren't at their best. <laughs> Once they were up 30, they just kind of just poo was running down their legs and uh, they pooed themselves. That's what I was trying to say. I know. I think we got that, Jay. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> but like, <laughs> it's just too many times they've done this where their issue repeatedly is that they just play too slow and they get into stuff too late in the shot clock and it leaves them with no option other than a fadeaway bullshit ISO. So just just fix that. Fix that and you'll have a great chance to win a championship. Just fix that. I'm fine with isolations if they come after them running something to get a mismatch. Like against the Cavs, they got the mismatch they wanted with Jason Tatum isolating against Darius Garland. I don't think it was the best shot, but like I'm going to take they that. They had to go earlier, though. They did. That was the I, dumbest I, shot because it was so late. That's why I, it was a dumb shot. It, it was the right matchup to pick on, but they went so fucking slow that they left themselves with, with one out, and that was to make a contested fadeaway bullshit shot. I agree. Uh, I was mainly arguing that they should have some sort of process to try and get into something. That is what their main strength is this year is being able to exploit mismatches. I think they do run a decent amount of isolation, but it's after identifying what that mismatch is and getting it to the right guy, whether that be Chris Tapps and Porzingis against the small or maybe a smaller guy against Tatum and Brown or a, a, a big against Tatum and Brown. You have to do something and, as you noted, do it with pace and get into it um, so you have an opportunity to make and plays. And do it with physicality, too. Like – that play, the Jalen play you were talking about, Chris Stops was trying to set a screen and got bumped off his line, and it just didn't work. I had a crazy thought today, and tell me if I'm an idiot. I know you'd be willing to do so. Yes. Yes, you are. All right. Outside of that initial uh, kind of assessment of my intelligence, has Chris Tapps been a little bit worse over like the last month and a half? I'm going based on eye test alone. I feel like he's been less of a physical presence and he can be pushed around a little bit more when he catches against uh, these supposed mismatches. Am I crazy? Is this an eye test that's fooling me? What do you, what do you say? What say no, you about his efficiency has gone down? Um, and, and yeah, I, 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 I don't know if it's partially because the NBA has called fewer fouls recently. Obviously, there's been a lot about that trend. Um, but I think, honestly, I think that's a good thing for him to go through now because he hasn't played playoff basketball in a while. He, The last time he did, he was on a Dallas Mavericks team. They told him to stay in the corner, and and that they was it. They told him not to post up. There was like a whole Rick Carlisle. They was like, We're, we don't want him to do that at all because he's 0. .5 points per possession for every post up. It was point eight one, but yeah, you are a basketball nerd. <laughs> but yeah, um, so I, I think it's good for him to to deal with the physicality now to be able to play through it, uh, and it's it's obviously not playoff level right now, but but the fact that the NBA loosened things up a little bit now because they they do loosen it up in the playoffs, you can always get away with more physicality, you can always be tougher. And and he's going to have to play through that. And he's going to have to be able to be effective in the low post against very good defenders. Even their, the wing defenders will be big and strong, and they'll be trying to push him around. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you. He hasn't been at the same level where it was just an auto bucket when he got the ball earlier in the season. He's still been pretty effective, though. and And it's just like this is all stuff that – that he can use later on to me. I think he is, it's a bold take, but I think he's going to be such a major key for them in the playoffs on the offensive end, just because I feel like the one way you really slow down this Boston Celtics team is they're so good when you put two on the ball of like their ball movement. They have play, play five great shooters. They're going to knock down threes. If you commit two to the ball, one way to not commit to is to switch everything. And when if you switch everything, Chris Tapps has to dominate so much in those matchups 
that their people like they're reluctant to kind of just switch a small onto Chris Tapps. And I think he has to be consistently good and aggressive in those matchups to make it. So that's just not like the basic shell defense that the heat, I said the heat, but like, uh, cause they did a very good job of switching, uh, against the Celtics in the past two years in the playoffs, but you have to be able to punish teams who do that. And I think he's key to that. And so I hope you're right that he's getting this, these kind of reps now with a more physical defense, uh, because I think like it really opens up their offense if uh, teams are just not able to switch. Yeah. If he's pulverizing switches, that just takes them to another level. It does. And, and so, yeah, I mean, he's a key to, to beating some of the not junk defenses, but some of the more effective defenses that have kind of taken them out of their identity over the past couple off seasons. So, or the past couple of playoffs. So yeah, he has to be at a high level and, and I mean, he, he, he had the injury. He had a minutes restriction for like a game or two after that. So probably still trying to get some rhythm back to some extent. Um, but yeah, like the, the, his ability to rise to the playoff intensity is one of the question marks that I have. How is that going to look when teams are getting up under him, when they are forcing him further out, when they are making it harder for him to get to the spots where he's so effective? How does it all work? Because we haven't seen him in the playoffs in a long time. And when he when he was in the playoffs, it was a totally different role. And at that point, like he just didn't have the post up game that he does now. So he's going to be kind of learning on the fly I think how to how to diagnose and beat some of the coverages. I think it's also going to be interesting to see how like willing the Jays and I guess the rest of the team are to kind of play through him and then if he struggles are they willing to continue to like play through him knowing that like that matchup is so important for them or if he struggles early do they go away from it? Um, which I think would be a mistake. So I think it's, it's yeah. Gonna... What's that trust level like? And I think it should be high based on the way Kristaps has helped them during the regular season. I think it should be high based on everything Joe Mazzulla has stressed to the players this year about how important Kristaps will be to figuring out those coverages. But but it's one thing to say that now in the regular season when they're on pace for sixty five wins, and it's another thing when you're down to one in a playoff series and you can either, you know, ISO against a big or just take a dribble out and throw it down to Chris stops down low. What's your choice going to be then? I don't know, but, but they know what they should do. They know, <laughs> they know everything Missoula has told them about trusting each other and trusting Porzingis. And I think the way Porzingis, I also think he's a gamer. Like he's not someone who's going to shy away from the playoff spotlight. I think he's going to love the playoff spotlight. I think he's going to really relish it. So, so that that's another thing I think is important to keep in mind here is like he's wanted this spotlight again after playing in Washington. He he's wanted it after being in Dallas and and things didn't go really the way that he wanted. So, I think it's going to be pretty important. Uh, to him to play well in those moments. And I think he's the type of competitor that will really appreciate that. Plus it's much easier to like fist pump and wink at the crowd when you have a good performance in the garden uh, as opposed to a bad one. So I think all interested parties would like to see him uh, do well. Big winker. Uh, Jay, we're going to play a game right now. It's going to be a bit of a role play. You are going to be playing right now. Joe Missoula. Okay. Okay. Celtics have ten games left in the season. What are you working on in those final ten games? Because it feels like maybe the the brain trust over there at the Boston Celtics, they're not really going to let you play a full game with all your starters, all your full lineup. Every like prioritizing rest. So you have all these mix and match lineups out there. Maybe you get wild, you throw uh, Springer out there for the final eight minutes of, or in the fourth quarter. But considering the kind of lineup restrictions, what are you looking to see out of your ball club over these final 10 games that are essentially meaningless? 
I want mindset. I want mentality. I want success to look different every night for every player. You are Joe Missoula. <laughs> <laughs> Those are like the, the three things he says, no matter what. No matter Get, what. Getting more spacing quickly. Spacing. I feel like spacing, he said that more last year. Oh, he's he's hit it a number of times this year. But um, but last year it was like spacing, 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 spacing. Now it's like mindset, motherfucker. We need to be tough. You know, uh, last year he said like, "Oh, I just I forgot to bring up defense every day." Do you think there's anything he's forgotten to bring up so far this year that he no, maybe regretting? No, he he preaches the shit that he wants this year. He is he is hammering home those points. Probably to an annoying extent. Um, no, I I think I liked that they started big yesterday against Atlanta. Like, just try it out. Why not? You have the one seed clinched. You have plenty of games where you're going to be shorthanded. Try new shit. See what it looks like with basically Jason Tatum at point guard. See what it looks like. Um, and I think he's done that with different front courts. He's 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 just i don't i don't know if experiment is the right word but he's he's definitely gone to to stuff that they haven't seen very much to try to to figure some stuff out um yeah and i would i would want to i mean as bad as that atlanta game was great opportunity to emphasize all the stuff we talked about and all the stuff that the coaching staff has has stressed to these guys like it is unforgivable to get an eight second violation in the NBA in the final minutes of a game. Like just fucking dribble the thing past half court. Just play with a little pace. Just play a little faster. So I uh yeah, Joe, I mean he's done a great job and it was in did you watch um I didn't watch the whole listen to the whole podcast yet with Draymond Green and Drew Holiday, but I saw some of the clips floating online. And I, th I thought it was interesting what what Drew was saying. You haven't seen it. I've I've probably seen the same clips as you. I didn't. Did he say something about Joe? So he was talking about his defensive role this season, and just talking about how different it was. And he was saying basically, like in Milwaukee when he was in New Orleans, he did the same thing every possession. He was guarding the ball. He was forcing like trailing a guy over a screen, funneling him to either Anthony Davis in New Orleans or Brooke Lopez in Milwaukee and was just kind of like that was his role. And now he said he like the Celtics have just weaponized him differently. And he said, you know, sometimes I'm on a non-shooter. Sometimes I'm on Joel Embiid. Sometimes I'm on like just all sorts of different players. And, and he said like the level of thinking that goes into his role now is just totally different. And that he really enjoys it, and I think that's that's part of the part of what Joe has stressed. Like since he got the job, really is is basically like everybody has to think the game together, and they all have to be on the same page. And he kind of has like I don't want to say it's like Phil Jackson with the triangle offense, but Phil Jackson with the triangle offense, the whole thing was like we have to work in unison, and and we have to. And that's like the the way to to maximize a team. And I think Steve Kerr has kind of done it with the Warriors. Is like he doesn't run a lot of high pick and roll. He likes to play the game where they use everybody. And and obviously it helps to have Stephen Curry. It helps to have Michael Jordan. But but they they want everybody to think the game together and be on the same page. And they think that's the way to maximize a team. And I think Joe. He doesn't approach it the same way as those guys do. They don't have the same offense those guys do. They don't have Michael Jordan or Stephen Curry, but just the the thinking of the game has been something that he stressed. And so I thought it was interesting what what Drew said about that and just how different his role is now. And he said he he never really had to be the communicator before. Um because his role was just like guard the ball, stop the ball, funnel the ball, and that was it. And now now he's kind of being the quarterback, and he, he really enjoys it from what he was saying. 
the Drew piece is so interesting because he is, I feel like, really flown under Don't the call ring. it a dead arm, by the way. Dead arm? Don't call it a dead arm. Don't call it a comeback? I've been here for years. What should I call it? I, I mean, he initially called it a dead arm, I believe, and then he said it wasn't a dead arm. So, But he didn't give it something to replace it with? He just said this is not a dead arm? Yeah. Uh, non-living appendage. What I don't know what else you would call it. It sounds like a dead arm, but I don't no, know. It's a living arm. His arm's uh, alive. Good reason not to call it a dead arm, then. Um, his just role on this team, I feel like, has been so under-celebrated with how great the Celtics have been. Obviously, he's taken a back seat on the defensive. I mean, on the offensive end, and he has his crazy three-point shooting in the corner, which I think we talked about, his crazy just attempts from three, his step back, which he can clearly knock down. Early in the year, it was just the constant lefty layups attempts that didn't really work. But we've talked about the Porzingis role in this. Drew in the playoffs, in whatever role he has, in uh, but just as a stabilizing force and a guy who can think the game, uh, I think he's going to play a major, major impact on this team and just like he's won a he's won a finals before. He's been through it. He was, I think I saw a clip on him on that Draymond uh podcast where he's like, there's just always a moment in the playoffs where shit goes wrong and you have to be have the right mindset. I think he's gonna be a, a major stabilizing um impact on this team. And maybe I don't want to denigrate Marcus Smart, but maybe a guy You're out there denigrate him now. Days, I'm only doing it relative to Drew Holiday. I think Marcus Smart was certainly capable of some crazy plays, but I don't know if his uh, necessarily was a, a a stabilizing force for the Celtics. I feel like Drew has the same level of potential for just like outstanding defensive play or a st- outstanding hustle play, um, but he doesn't really need the ball on offense. He's going to hang out in the corner, and I feel like he's just um, a real undersung hero uh, potentially for what this like team can be in the playoffs. And everyone's talking about like freaking out about the late game execution. But I just feel like this team with Chris Tapps and with Drew is totally different than any team the Celtics have kind of put forward in the playoffs. It's it's not the same. It's not remotely the same. They don't have the same issues. They don't have anyone you can help off of. Like Marcus Smart would make threes sometimes. And sometimes he would hurt teams for, for leaving him. But if, like, you could leave him. You could. If you leave Drew Holiday in the corner, that's bad news. If you leave Derek White the way that he's shooting now, you're in trouble. If you leave any of the other guys, you're just a moron. So, yeah, they're, they don't have as many flaws. Chris Stops changes things. And then I think just there's been a lot of, of improvement on, of guys on the roster of just becoming more more all around players. And so yeah, the, like to be afraid for the Celtics because of what happened in 2022. I get it. I understand it. To be afraid of them because of what happened last year against the Heat. Yeah, like it's going to happen. People still have those fears. But but this team is different and that said, if they do go out in a similar fashion again, don't even need to bring it up with don't this roster. Need to bring it up. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Yeah, if they're gonna lose, lose in a different fashion. I'd rather them be swept than, uh, you know. Actually, no, that's not true. I I forget I even said anything. Right now, we're gonna go to our mainest man, one of the legends. That's the highest tier on the Patreon. Gambling Grant is here, and as a legend, he gets to join us for all the broadcasts. Grant, how are you doing? Good. How are you guys? Doing well. Doing, doing well. Great. What What do you feel about Jonte Porter, my man? <laughs> Jonte Porter. Uh, can't say I have too many. Uh, you haven't seen the them. scandal, have you? Uh, is that the Raptors player? That you call yourself the, Gambling the, Grant, yeah, and, and gambling you don't know Grant. about the Jonte Porter? Okay, not so living up the, to the name. He's the Raptors player that's under investigation for gambling. Like, uh, 
leaving uh, games a little early, just whenever his point total was at like seven and a half, and he yeah, just just with like just two. faking an injury to hit the under, no big Making deal. Making an eye in the injury, he does have his own private Discord where he gives out investment tips, <laughs> so he does like to find that edge. Um, but maybe, as they say in like the the hedge fund term, he's finding that dark edge. Maybe he's playing a little fast and loose with regulations. You know, I with like how loose gambling is right now, and like the NBA is just promoting it now going to be on their app. I'm sure it's going it, to, you're going to hear a couple of stories every month, but I respect it. <laughs> you respect it. A lot of respect I, for John Tate Porter's approach. Javen points. Who cares? Uh, I mean, he's not on a, on a big time contract, so got to make that money. Oh, yeah. I did want to say, yeah, we derailed you there with the did John Tate Porter talk. So sorry. No worries. <laughs> Uh, I do have to say I'm in the fight for my life right now in uh, my dynasty playoffs and Jimmy Butler taking the night off for a uh, illness just really makes me want to beat the heat first round even more um, because that guy, (laughs) he's so frustrating. So that that's all you got. You just, you just, you just (laughs) came on to, to tell us that Jimmy Butler boned your fantasy squad. He might be. Uh, no, but what I wanted to say was uh, I really like – I don't think there's a lot to worry about with this team. It's funny because I was listening to uh, the earlier episodes uh, that you guys came out with, uh, and the Drew Holiday trade was one of the – obviously the big topic at the beginning of the new Still Potable podcast. And talking about, I like that you're going back and listening to the the first, the early. I love that. That's awesome. Doing the full library. I figure I might as well get it all in while I can. Uh, Not that I'm going to be leaving or anything, but be like uh, Grant. Listen to Still (laughs) Potable. Subscribe today. Patreon.com/slash Still Potable. I wanted to. I needed to hear from like why the anything potable became still potable. That background story and. Uh, the introduction theme song. I needed to see when that came into play. Uh, so I'm just getting my still potable history up to That's date. Important. I'm glad you caught up. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Still got a lot to work with, but um, I still think this team is like completely different. Did we say smart stuff about the Drew Holiday trade at the time? Yeah. I mean, I was just, I, I got up to right after the Bucks reporter was on, just like talking about how, uh, how everybody likes Drew Holiday, no bad reviews. And how he has uh, the strongest core of any human. The strongest ever core, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's the most, like, underrated player in the league. and uh, It's funny that he was just on Draymond Green's podcast talking about, like, how he plays defense now, like, uh, just completely different than he did with the Bucks. So I think all the talking points were hit. Like, it's showing that he's just a game changer when he's in there. And he's just a calming presence. Even though he does some crazy shit like once or twice a game. It's, he, the, it's he, the calm of chaos. You need some sort of chaos element there. But, and he'll but bring most it. of the time, he's, it's not chaos. It's just he does his job. He doesn't care about any of the, the nonsense. He just wants to win. He wants to play whatever role they ask of him. He guards any type of player and is in the right spot all the time, competing all the time. Like you don't have to worry about a thing with Drew Holiday except the occasional like nonsensical pull up three. And that's that's about it. Appreciate you coming on, Grant. Thanks hey, for coming. Tom, thank my you guys dude. for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Grant. One of the legends. Always appreciate him checking out. You know, and you know what? Go back and listen to it. We had a, probably had an excellent analysis about Drew Holiday. We we got a voicemail here. Oh, you're right. Re- are you ready to play it? I didn't know we, we had voicemails. We got a voicemail. Let's hear it. I don't even know who it's from. I'm guessing it's Josh B. No, it's not Josh B. Oh, I hope it's the weird guy who just plays us uh, soundtracks from uh, or audiobooks. That was a fun little stage. I know I get roasted in the chat for negativity, but. Um, oh, it's my guy AJ. They these guys, 
the the through three coaches. I don't think people talk about this enough. Three coaches have had bad balls, balls slow, whatever. <laughs> they slow down the ball. They don't pass the ball. They ho- ex- execute horribly. I can't even speak. Um, in late game situations, and I love my guys, but like, it's crazy. Like, is this just who they are? Like, there's just no change. Like, a coach can't even like work with them or like make them do other crap. Like, it's it's literally been Brad, Ime, Joe. Like, no change, and people are like blame coaching for late game execution, but. It's been, it's maybe just them, and that makes me really sad. And even when they're the best team in the NBA, uh, it makes me sad that uh, <laughs> this, this stuff happens. So they, they just keep having bad possessions to end close games, and they've had a lot of good ones too. But it's not a, it's not a, a surprise. It's just. It's just reality with them, and it's like maybe the only thing to be negative about, but it's gonna bite them in the ass if if if, if it all comes in the playoffs if they're in a situation where they it matters what they do. So I don't know. See ya. I love it. That I was mean, such was, a sad voicemail. Yeah, this is just a, the like, voice. You could just tell he was line. somber. Yeah, he's using the voicemail line to vent. Um, and deal with all his uh, his worries. His he sorrow. couldn't even speak for a while. He was so devastated. Yeah, no, I thought he was high out of his gourd to begin with, but no, he was just deeply caught up in his emotions. Here's what I'll say: I don't think we can claim that Brad this is a Brad Stevens issue. What the 2020 bubble Eastern Conference playoffs? We're going to say that when Jason Tatum was 22 years old and Jalen Brown was 23, and they really had no business being there because Daniel Tice was their starting center. I don't think we can talk about that. The Ime Udoka uh, team that made it to the finals and just happened to, I don't think the issue necessarily in the finals was their, their late game offense. I just think they, yes, it was. Oh yes, it was. It was not the issues. They had, uh, they were up in the fourth quarter of game four. Yes. And just basically never scored again. It's not necessarily, it was like the final four minutes. Again, I believe in game five, just the same shit. It's not Believe the same it. exact issue they're talking about now. The issue they're talking about now is like the final two minutes of the game. And like being very slow. They turned the ball over a lot. That was also a defensive-minded team where they did not have spacing because they had Al Horford and Robert Williams on the court at uh, all times. And they did not finish with Derek White. Uh, I think it's a completely different team. At some part of the day, it's on the players, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Like, I think Joe Mazzulla is not the one calling out, do nothing uh, as they run down the court. And so I don't think it's like, make sure you take more than eight seconds getting it across half court, boys. Yeah, I don't think he has hand signals for that. And so I don't know. I don't think it's like reasonable to blame it on the coaches. I think it's Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. I would, yes, I agree with you. I think this is my guy, AJ, who is filling the chat with negativity, which I love to see. You got to get different perspectives in the Patreon chat. Um, but now I see that that negativity came from a deep place of sadness. And I just want to be there like the team's 57 and 15. They're played better offensive basketball than they ever have in the history of these Boston Celtics, not the whole franchise. I'm sure there's been actually in terms of numbers wise, I don't think there's been a better offense. Um, there has but been the entire history of the NBA. That's that's what I was going for there. I do th- I understand the frustration, but we're talking about a March basketball game, um, and maybe we can revisit this in the playoffs if it happens again. But I just have kind of faith in them to correct it because, as good as they were last year, they've had just a better process for the entire season this year, and it goes back to what Jay is saying: is like thinking the game. They have been trained very well and have executed, mo- for the most part, very well this year to kind of just recognize what the defense is giving them and make the according adjustment and kind of take it and make the right play. And um, albeit there's been some moments where they haven't played fast enough, but I just think in the playoffs, when the games get more serious, they're going to make the adjustments. Maybe it's blind faith of me doing that. Maybe it's just wishful thinking, but um, 
I don't know. I just can't blame it on Joe Mazzula at this point. I love, I love how at the end of just like being so sad, you're just like, it's really the only thing you can get mad about <laughs> with them. And it's true. But in every loss, it seems like the same the same shit happens. And it takes it takes some weird shit to beat the Celtics most of the time. I think the of you the gotta last... miss a bunch of threes. For the Celtics need to miss a bunch of threes for it to be like a close game. Of the three losses since February 1st, the Nuggets game was the most normal. The Cavs game was just just a disgusting. Dean Wade. Dean Wade. The, the Hawks game was just got up 30, fucked around and found out. Krejci yeah. is the – I've always said Krejci is the Czechoslovakian Dean Wade. <laughs> I've long said that. Yeah, I mean, that's what the people are saying. You got anything else, Jay? It's It really is hard to put everything into perspective with this team. Because if you look objectively at everything, they are one of the best teams in the history of basketball. They are just stomping teams. They doesn't matter whether they play good teams, bad teams, at home, on the road, second leg of a back to back, more rest. Like they have just kicked the shit out of the teams. But because there are the scars, and because you don't know how much the past will still matter, even with this new roster, even with Chris Asperzingis, even with Drew Holiday, even with Joe Mazzulla, a much better coach in year two than he was in year one. It's hard to put everything in perspective. Like, how much does it matter that they went too slow against the Hawks and didn't close out a game and had some trouble against a bad team? How much does that matter? Especially when Jaden Springer's playing crunch time, when Derek White's out, when Drew Holiday's out. Should people freak out about that? I get freaking out about it. I get being sad like AJ is. I understand that. We don't. I just want to say we don't know if it's AJ. I just think it's AJ. Just that guy. Might be AJ. Possibly AJ. Say your name next time, coward. <laughs> <laughs> but for real, like I get being afraid of all that stuff. And it's it's really hard to win a championship. They're gonna have to be fantastic to beat whoever it is that they play throughout their playoffs. But at the same time, like all the evidence suggests this is a different team. This is a much better team. It's a more complete team. The bench has been fantastic. Peyton Pritchard has just reached another level. So there's a lot of reason to not overlook the hiccups at the end of games, but to put them in perspective and say this could matter, but the preponderance of evidence Ooh. suggests – that's that's a lawyer word that's for more it. More than fifty percent. The preponderance of evidence. Suggests, I would say clear and convincing evidence, even higher standards. This, this is the best Celtics team in a long, long time, and we haven't seen a Celtics team this good since Kevin Garnett was around and healthy. So, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes, but it really so it, comes it's it's hard to talk about though. It really is. <laughs> should we freak out about that shit? I don't fucking know. I don't fucking know. It's possible we should be freaking out. It's possible that the slow down late game bullshit that cost them a game in Cleveland, that cost them against Atlanta, maybe that's the only thing that matters right now. But it's also possible that them kicking the shit out of teams regularly it's it's is what really matters. What they are. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a classic battle between your brain and your heart. And I would say uh, for still potable fans out there, combine the two. Listen to your brain's heart, you know, and, and fuse uh, between both the objective and the subjective. Be better. You can do both. Use those emotions to guide you towards a, a greater future and a more prosperous uh, just moving forward for a better tomorrow. And I think the one way you can do that, really focus your energy on um, positivity is by continuing listening to Still Potable.
go to patreon.com. If you're on the YouTubes right now, watching the CLNS YouTubes, go to patreon.com slash still potable. Subscribe today. This is going to be one hell of a playoff run. You're going to be one a part of the still potable community. We have an amazing chat. You can be a legend like Gambling Grant or Josh B and join us for every podcast we do. And so please join us. It's going to be a hell of a postseason run. We appreciate everyone who tuned in on the CLNS YouTube. Again, this is brought to us by the Prize Picks. Go to Prize Picks, use promo code CLNS, and I think you'll get a hundred dollar deposit match. We appreciate everyone who joined us, and we'll be back tomorrow with a huge guest, a huge guest. And so you're going to want to tune in to listen to that. Uh, And thanks, everyone, for listening to this episode of Steel Potter. Still part of the